All right, hello everyone. This is Esteban. You're watching the Bad Dog Agility Show. Today we have a great topic for you. It's all about the serpentine. So serpentine handling. We're going to talk about three different things. Before we get to that, let's start with our microphone check, our audio visual check. If you can hear me, if you can see me waving my hands, give us a thumbs up, give us a heart, give us one of those smiley faces. Whatever Facebook is putting out there right now, go ahead and give us one of those. We just want to make sure everything's working. Okay, we've got the thumbs up from Sarah, so we're good to go. The three things we're going to talk about. First, we're going to talk about serpentines and tell you exactly what they are, because I know a lot of you are beginners, you're new to agility, but even some of the seasoned pros don't really understand what serpentines are all about. Is it a sequence of obstacles? Or is it a handling maneuver? So we're going to talk about that. The next thing we're going to talk about is the different kinds of serpentines. I like to break them down into two large groups. The classic serpentine, that is three jumps in a straight line that everybody thinks about, and the non-traditional serpentines. Other places on course where you can use serpentine handling even though it's not three jumps in a straight line. And the final thing that we're going to talk about, I'm going to give you three key execution points on how to do your serpentines really well. And this is going to help you a lot in your execution of those, uh, those maneuvers. Um, we're starting a little bit earlier today because we had some stuff going on in the evening. And so it's much brighter, very sunny. So you're going to see me squinting a lot. So just wanted to give you a heads up there. All right, so first, we're going to address the question of what exactly is a serpentine? And when people say serpentine and agility, you're talking with your instructor, you're at dinner after a show, and everyone's like, man, I did a great serpentine. Sometimes they'll use the slang SERP, S-E-R-P, a shorthand for serpentine. I serped that jump. Okay, that means they performed the serpentine maneuver at a specific place. So a serpentine can be a handling maneuver, but it can also be a series of obstacles. So in this case, I'm going to show you the classic three jump serpentine setup over here. We've got jump number one. Dog will take it this way. This is jump number two. Here we're going to take jump number three. And then the dog is going to turn this way. So you can see we have three jumps next to each other in a straight line. This is the classic serpentine setup that people are familiar with. So when you start looking at a course map and you're walking a course, it is correct to say, oh, look, I think I see a serpentine here on the course. OK, so it does refer to obstacles and how they're laid out. So that's one definition of a serpentine. But the other one, as I mentioned, is the actual handling maneuver. That's what we're going to focus on today. So it is both. It can be both a verb. You know, I serp that jump or a noun I did. Um, or I see a serpentine laid out on the course. Or I wonder if those three jumps, the dogs are going to take that as a serpentine. Because obviously, if there's three jumps out here, but the dog is only using two of the jumps, they're not going to do a serpentine. They're not going to have that S shape, uh, which is what serpentine means. OK, so that's the, that's the first question. So next, we're going to talk about uh, the traditional and non-traditional serpentines. We just showed you the classic three jump setup. So what do we mean when we say non-traditional serpentine? Well, today we don't have a slow motion video. And I, I do apologize for that. We had some technical difficulties here. So I'm going to bring Brittany out. This is Brittany Schesler. She's going to be my uh, claymation Gumby model. How many people used to watch that show Gumby? Love Pokey. Pokey. Pokey was the horse. And they were made out of clay. He was just a little green blob made out of clay. And his name was Gumby. OK, she's going to be our Gumby. All right? And the first thing she's going to do is show us the actual definition of handling as far as a serpentine. So the only definition you need to remember for handling a serpentine is the handling, the serpentine maneuver, the handling, takes place at the obstacle if it makes sense for you to front cross before and after that obstacle. And that's it. If you look at any sequence in agility, and it makes good sense to front cross before it and after it, then you have the option of doing a serpentine maneuver. So first, Brittany, show us two front crosses, how you would handle this classic three jump sequence here. So Brittany's the handler. She goes in. There's a front cross. And there's a front cross. OK, so she did a front cross here before and a front cross here after. 
So because she's doing a front cross before and after this jump, this middle jump is the critical jump. This is the jump where we can do our serpentine maneuver. So what is the serpentine maneuver? Brittany, go ahead and demonstrate the serpentine maneuver. Start back here at jump number one. Okay, so instead of going in and front crossing over there and then coming out here and front crossing over here, Brittany stayed on this side the entire time and this is the power and magic of the serpentine because it gives the handler a shorter path and it creates a better, tighter turn here at jump number two because the handler is able to get further ahead of the dog. So it's very advantageous to do the serpentine and if you time it for the vast majority of dogs, a serpentine will be a little bit faster because it removes a stride when performed correctly than two front crosses. So this is why people are always excited when they see serpentines because they know they can save time and you can save time too. Okay, so this is the traditional or classic setup. Now, something that we can do that is very cool is we can change our targets. So let's keep jumps number one and number two the same. And we're gonna take our third jump and we're gonna disappear it and we're gonna turn it into this jump over here. So now we're going one, two, three over here. So this is not a classic serpentine configuration. If you're a beginner and you go to an agility trial and you see this on the course map, one, two, three, in your mind, you're not thinking, oh, well, that's a serpentine setup, because it's not. But you can use serpentine handling the same way. So Brittany is first gonna show you with the front crosses. So Brittany shows up at a trial, she sees this sequence here, and she's gonna run it with front crosses. So she's gonna front cross here, and she's gonna front cross again and go over that green jump. So again, she did a front cross before and after this middle jump. That should ring a bell now because we've taught you, you can front cross before and after an obstacle. You can also serpentine it. So she's gonna serp it this time. Go ahead and do it with the serpentine. Okay, and so she keeps a nice smooth line, creates a very tight turn here at the second jump and takes the dog very nicely over the green, okay? Now, we're gonna keep the first two jumps the same, and this jump here, the third jump, we're gonna disappear it, we're gonna move it over here, and we're gonna change it into a tunnel. So now we've got a different, completely different target. Again, if you see this sequence, jump, jump, tunnel, in your head, this doesn't look like the classic serpentine at all, but, Let's take a look at Brittany doing some front crosses on it. So Brittany shows up at a trial, she sees it, she's gonna front cross here, and now she's gonna front cross again to get the dog into the tunnel, away from those off course obstacles. She's done a front cross before and after this jump. That tells me she can do a serpentine maneuver right here. So go ahead and do this with the serpentine. And so you see how easy and smooth it is. She doesn't have to do two difficult front crosses a nice, easy serpentine maneuver. So again, she's done the serpentine handling, even though this wasn't a classic serpentine setup. So I like to call these non-traditional, non-classic, um, completely made up, call it whatever you want. But there are places that you can do serpentine handling, even though it doesn't look like the classic three jump sequence that everybody gets really excited about when they see it on a course map. Okay, so now we've messed with the ending. Let's put the ending back. Jump number three, we're gonna put it back in its original place. Here's our jump number two. Now we're gonna move our jump number one. Okay, and I'm gonna take jump number one, I'm just gonna move it right over here. Okay, and so now Brittany is gonna come over here. And I'll, I'll just help her out. I'm gonna be Brittany's dog, I'll just stand here. And go ahead, and we're gonna do this with the two front crosses. So there's one front cross. And, oh, go ahead and go back to the original. The original, sorry. So we're gonna keep two and three the same, like the original, and she's gonna go in there and do her second front cross and finish out. So again, she's done her two front crosses, so now Brittany can do her serpentine handling. So go ahead and we'll dem demonstrate the serpentine handling. So it turns out you can also change jump number one, okay? You can change both jump number one and jump number three so let's go ahead and do that. So for jump number one, we're gonna make it this one. For jump number three, we're gonna make it the tunnel. 
And this purple one is going to be our middle jump, so with the front crosses. So front cross, front cross into the tunnel, OK? And then how would you serpentine it? Very good. OK, so the point of all of these um, uh, claymation demos that we did here with me and Brittany here, actually, the claymation will be a little more on the execution part. Here, I just kind of made her walk through it for you guys. Um, the key point here is you see two front crosses around one obstacle. You can do a serpentine maneuver there, save yourself time and save yourself running distance and not have to do two very difficult front crosses. And so that's the advantage that we're picking up there. OK, now that we have done that, I do want to go into the execution points. And then I think we'll go ahead and do the demos. But I think it'll help you to see, maybe see the execution points uh, first. So three key execution points I want to give you. Execution point number one is you should be turning toward the dog over this second obstacle. So some of you may have already seen it. Brittany, go ahead and do your serpentine maneuver and freeze when you hit that wing. OK, so she is freezing in position here. I'm going to be the dog. Hopefully, you're zoomed in enough that you can see this. As I'm looking at this jump, I'm the dog. I see Brittany. She's looking at me. I'm looking at her. I see her chest. She can see my chest. It's like a magnet, a magnetic relationship with your dog, right? I want to get to my handler. The handler wants me to get there, all right? Now, let's say Brittany does not turn, turn her chest toward me. She's just, she's just running. She's not even looking at me. She's got her arm out there, OK? I see that, and I'm coming. Remember, I'm coming this way on the serpentine, heading in this direction. I'm just going to parallel her, because this is what our dogs do, right? I parallel the path. So how many of you are doing these serpentines, and your dog doesn't take the second jump, right, the middle jump? The critical jump, they just go right by, right? So part of the problem is you may be running by without turning your chest toward the dog, OK? So what I like to tell people and what I like to do is look at my dog through the upright. I want to look at them. I'm the dog. She's the handler. She's going to look at me, and she's going to point her chest towards me. And that's going to really help bring me in here. Now she can go wherever she wants to go, and now I'm going to follow her and we have a successful serpentine here. That's execution point number one. Got to be looking at your dog through the upright. If you can't see your dog through the upright, things are going to go wrong. OK, so execution point number two is you want to be ahead on serpentines. And people underestimate how far ahead you need to be. In my old age now, um, I am using less serpentines because I'm not quite as quick, so I can't get out as far ahead as I want to be. So let's look at it this way. I like to say handler needs to be in this area by this wing, just like Brittany is. She's right here by this wing, while the dog is on the takeoff side somewhere over here. Why? Because as I take off and Brittany moves, as I'm in the air, Brittany's so far ahead, this space is clear. I can land there safely and go on to the next part of the course. Watch what happens if Brittany is not ahead. And this happens to handlers, including myself, all the time. We want to serp, but uh-oh, look. She's frozen right here. She's at this wing, but I'm at this wing too. OK? And I have to take off right now. And as I take off, guess what? Oh, no. The handler is exactly where I need to land. The handler is in my space. Many, many dogs, including my own, will drop this bar because they are desperately trying to avoid running into you. So they will shorten their stride. They will do funny things with their legs, and this bar will come down. And this is why this is known as a high-pressure bar. When you do a serpentine and you do it poorly, it is a high-pressure bar. You're putting a lot of pressure over the bar. It will frequently drop, most commonly because the handler is in the dog's landing space. And that's why it's so important to be ahead. I'm not saying you can't get away with this from time to time, OK? Sometimes I'm even you know, right alongside my dog, and then I'm able to go on, and no nothing horrible happens. They don't run into me, OK? The bar stays up. We get a clean run. You win a million dollars, whatever. But this is where a lot of bad stuff can happen. I once had a border collie. As I came over, 
she jumped right into my body and I caught her like a football. Okay, but fortunately she was a little border collie, 23 pounds. So, you know, I just caught her and I put her down and it was okay. Imagine a 70 pound lab coming through here. So a lot of you who are learning this, if you see that your dog, you're in their space and they're gonna collide with you, abort. Just let them land. Just be very, very careful. You're gonna see a lot of collisions in practice. You've probably seen them in trials. So there is some risk to this move because you're so close to the jump. Um, even when you're a little bit further away, but we'll get to that in a minute. So anyway, key execution point number two is to be ahead of your dog. So we know two things now, right? You gotta turn your chest toward the dog and you wanna be ahead of your dog. Which brings us to um, staying out of your dog's way. So a lot of you, especially with bigger dogs, have um, developed uh, some distance and that's fine. It's perfectly okay, but you do also need the ability to come very close to the wing and to do your serpentines close to the wing because of the non-traditional serpentines, all right? And for that, we will have a cool demo um, in just a second, although maybe we can go ahead and do that demo now, I think. Okay, let's start with that demo. We're gonna go ahead and, and do that demo. So she's gonna do um, a non-traditional one that is uh, far away from distance, where she stays away, right? And then she's gonna have to do it closer in order to have some success. So let's just take a, take a look at what happens here. We'll do the far one first. So she's gonna go one, two, and we wanna get the dog into the tunnel. I guess we could do that. Okay, so before we do that, we're gonna do just the classic, the traditional with distance. So she's gonna try and be a little away, like five or six feet away from the jumps. Very nice. So if I look at Brittany's line, I can see she's a solid three, four, five, six, seven. She's about seven, seven and a half feet away from the jumps. That's a fair amount of distance. I think I see a lot of people handle it uh, this way from about this far. It's very nice. You don't have to worry about collision, right? You stay far away from your dog. And that's fine as long as you're doing the classic. But watch what happens when she needs to send the dog to the tunnel. Right? She can't turn the dog. She can't turn the dog here because as she's looking at the dog right here through this jump, there's all this space and the dog is just gonna take that space and head toward that jump. But if she's close, as the dog is jumping, she will move in this direction and that will cue the dog to come to the tunnel. So now she's gonna handle it close. So let's take a look. Beautiful turn into the tunnel. So you can see by handling the serpentine close, and being right here at this wing, as the dog is taking off, by the time the dog lands, Brittany is strongly heading in this direction. And when you're doing this massive distance over here, even if you're headed strongly in this direction, your position is so poor that without the aid of a verbal and a hope and a prayer, you, there's really no chance, especially with off courses over here, that you're gonna get your dog to that tunnel. And so that's why it's important to be able to do your serpentines both from a distance but also very close to the serpentine. So for those of you who are doing a lot of these non-traditional serpentines, make sure you can do them right at the wing, very close. Uh, for those of you who never do those and you only do these, that's totally fine. It's not wrong to do it far away. In fact, it'll give you some advantage if you're headed back in that other direction. Uh, one other quick note, I will put it in here. There are some of you who do serpentine maneuvers, okay, without actually using serpentine handling, right? They do kind of push-pull with their shoulders or verbals. So they might say over, come over, and they might use a verbal like out or right, you know, turn, turn to the right, and then go this way. So yes, your dog is doing a serpentine, but you are not using serpentine handling. You're just using push-pull or a verbal or an out. Again, totally fine to do that, no problem at all. Uh, some dogs will give you big S-shaped lines, but some dogs will do it pretty tightly, very nicely. But again, with that kind of handling, you don't have the option, the versatility of doing these non-traditional serpentines. And that's where the real magic is with serpentines. That's why serpentines are so valuable. Looking for these other spots that sometimes other people don't see. 
And so they're trying to get in these bad front crosses that are late, they get wide turns and off courses, and you get very nice tight turns and easy pass for you. Because I know a lot of you out there are a little bit slower than your dogs, a little bit older, you have knee problems. Would you rather do a serpentine or would you rather do your two front crosses? I would rather do the serpentine. And so that's why it can be a really uh, a great, uh, nice, big advantage for you. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and have Trek run through all of these options for you real quick. And this will be nice and challenging for Brittany. She'll have to like figure it out as I'm telling her. Didn't plan this in advance at all. So first we'll just have you do the classic serpentine and we'll do it with uh, like fairly close to the wings all the way through. So classic and then drive toward the A-frame. Oh, okay, and she loses Trek here. Sometimes when you're really close and the dog feels that you're stepping in, they will read backside on the third jump. So she did the serpentine correctly because that's the middle crucial second jump, but she missed the third target. So now for that, she's probably just gonna step away on that third jump, make sure she's not pushing to the back. Very nice. And then let's have you head for the green target. And then we'll do the tunnel one more time. So you can see all the different targets we're doing. Jumps one and two are the same. Jump three is different, different, and now to the tunnel, different. But everything, the key is right here at the far wing of the second jump. This is where all the magic happens. Okay, and into the tunnel. Very nicely done. All right, and we will go ahead and you can give her a break. And then we are going to um, talk about the opposite arm. Okay, so we already had a question pop up. And I'm totally blanking on the name of the person who asked the question, but it's a great question. And I will also reply to it after this uh, Facebook Live. But the question was, which arm do you use when you're looking at your dog and you're pointing your chest at them? So you notice that Brittany used the same arm that she brought the dog in on too. Right here. And this is Brittany with this arm. But a lot of people out there like to use the opposite arm, okay? Which one is right? Because there are people out there, a lot of you will probably have some instructors or friends who feel very strongly that you should be doing either this or this. You have people in, in both camps, okay? Um, even for ourselves, training as a group of like four or five, six people, we have differences in how we do our serpentines. And so our answer as a community is, it's dog dependent, and you can use either one, okay? And our proof, our evidence is this. There are numerous national and world champions who do it this way, like Brittany did it, and there are nu numerous world champions and national champions who do it this way, okay? So just like a weave pole methodology, uh, you can find success both ways. Well, then the more interesting question is, what's best for your dog? Okay, let me give you a hint. When you do it this way, like Brittany did it, and your chest turns towards the dog, and you do the opposite arm, I find when I do my opposite arm, the dog sees more of my chest. So let me, let me face the camera here. I'm gonna come in toward the camera a little bit. Okay. Okay, so this is, this is me, like Brittany's doing it, facing the camera. Now I'm, uh, now I'm gonna use my opposite arm. Okay, Brittany, opposite arm. So you can see there's a subtle shift in my body of a couple of degrees. So if your dog likes to run by the second jump, that critical jump, right? you try and do this arm and they keep running by it, and then you put it up this way, and then you're like, oh, the, the arm magically fixed it. Now they're doing it right. Just remember the arm is also having the effect of pulling your chest a little more towards your dog. So if you're struggling with it on this arm and for whatever reason you or your instructor really want to only do it with this arm, that's fine. Just turn your chest more towards your dog. So it looks like this. Okay, so really focus on the chest. You're looking. 
uh, your motion, you can slow down a little bit, especially in the teaching phase. That'll also help you out. So the big arm debate for us is either arm. It depends on the handler and the dog. Um, if you have a compelling reason to do one or the other, that's totally fine, usually related to other elements in your handling system. But if you're having issues, it's more about the chest and the facing. Um, okay, I think we have covered pretty much everything that I want to cover about serpentines. Now is the time for everybody to put in your questions. All right, so start putting in your questions. We will get some of those answered for you. Um, for anybody who put your questions in way earlier, Facebook is not showing us the older comments, so put your question in again. You covered this, but you can highlight the okay. not ahead of your dog. Kathy wants to know, how do you use a handler if it's very difficult to get ahead of your dog? You can make it just past the second jump uh, and then directing to the third jump. Okay. So sometimes that even happens to me. So that's a little bit more of a handling issue, but the key as always is to do the best that you can to be ahead, but let's say for whatever reason you're not, okay? And you're not ahead of your dog. It's a tie. Like I was, uh, uh, let's bring Brittany back. Brittany, this time you're gonna be the dog. Okay, and Brittany's gonna be here and she's gonna, she's gonna get ready to take off right here. Okay, so she's taking off, and I'm only about like right here. So Brittany, stop. Okay, so I'm here. I need to get my dog over uh, to this jump. Well, what I want to do is continue on a line that supports that jump. So if I know that Brittany, go ahead and jump and freeze. Okay, so Brittany is right here. She is headed in that direction. She's not headed toward this jump. Okay, I'm kind of right beside Brittany here. I need her to go to this jump, right? If I'm facing this way, I have no chance of pushing her to this jump. I lean into her, right? We're going to collide. Okay, this is a problem and this is probably what you're running into. So just step forward, right? I try to turn her and it's, it's, it's uncomfortable, right? We're going to collide. But, but watch this. So I put her back. Now she's landed, okay? And now, even though I'm behind, even though I'm behind, I don't handle this way. I'm, I, I'm turned toward her, okay? Even though I'm behind. And this is the weird thing. So even though I'm behind, whichever arm I use, let's say I use this arm here. Even though I'm behind now, okay? And Brittany's landing ahead of me. She's looking at me, because I've got this arm, which means like come toward me. She wants to come toward me. And then as she's landing, even though I'm from behind, I change my arms and I open up and I take one step toward this jump, okay? And usually that's gonna be able to turn the dog away from you. All right, so that is the key point. So Brittany, we'll come back. Let me put you on the takeoff side. Okay, now you right here by the wing, and you don't move. Okay, you don't move, I'm gonna move around a little bit. Okay, so again, dog is taking off. If I just keep running like this and I never face the dog, I have no chance of moving them very well. Okay, without like a verbal or something. But even if we're dead even and I'm turned toward her, right, I can change her path. Okay, this is coming toward me and now this means move away from me. Okay, so it's a very subtle thing. But basically, if we're running the same line this way, I cannot affect her path very well. But if I draw her toward me, now when I open up, like a slingshot, I can turn her away from me. A little paradoxical, but that's how it's gonna work. So basically, even if your dog is really close, that's what you wanna do. Turn toward the handler and then, or turn toward the dog and then toward your new obstacle. Okay, we have a lot of questions now. Uh, right here. Okay, Crystal wants to know, for handlers who use the arm across the chest, are they in the same position on the second wing? Yes, everything is gonna be the same, just your arms are gonna be different. Right? And ideally, you want to be looking at your dog anywhere on that plane, anywhere on a plane to infinity. Um, so let's say, what's a good example here? Let's put the dog over here. So let's say, uh, this. hopefully this won't blow your mind too much. We're going to change number one. This is number two. This is the serp jump. Okay, so the dog, yes. So the dog's over there. So ideally, I'm looking at the dog through the upright. Hopefully from your camera angle, you can see that we're looking at each other. Okay. But I can be anywhere along this line to infinity. Yep. 
In fact, this would be really ideal, right? My dog takes that jump, and now I direct him to this jump, and I'm really far ahead, like 15 feet or so. But this is the same cue because I can see my dog through the upright. So what's bad? What's bad is if I'm way back here, or even here, I'm ahead of my dog. Here, I'm almost at the second wing, but I can't see my dog through the upright at all. So I really risk running by. Um, but everything else is gonna be the same. So it does, just the arm is gonna be a little bit different. It'll change your chest tilt a little bit, but everything else will be the same. Um, Susan wants to know, does using opposite arm serve get confused with throttles? Some people think so. I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, Sarah here, this Sarah. Uh, and I, you know, I'm gonna take this opportunity to, to <laughs> emphasize that there are two Sarahs. This is Sarah Fernandez Lopez, my wife, the mother of my children. Sarah Baker is our sponsored athlete. She does a lot of content for us too. They, I know they both kind of look similar-ish as well. Cute. From far yeah. away, you know, I've, maybe I accidentally, you know, said hi to one of them. Maybe I shouldn't have, I don't know. They look similar. They have the exact same first names, two different people. Okay, so Sarah Fernandez Lopez thinks that maybe with arm throttling where you use the opposite arm, she likes to preserve that cue. So she prefers using the same arm like Brittany did for her serpentines, okay? So I would say, yes, some people think so. No, I do not know for sure that that makes your threadles any worse or makes your serpentines worse. I think it means you have to be more precise in your positioning. You really have to be looking at your dog through the uprights. If you throw up that opposite arm and you're, and you're not yet to the second jump, then now it is going to look a lot like a threadle, yeah. I think. You want to avoid situations where one cue is going to look like the other. So you just have to be a little more precise. I think that's a good way to put it. Okay, so... Uh, Lois wants to know if you can get distance on the first jump. Yes. In fact, that's a great thing to do if you know you're doing the classic throttle and you're headed back that way. Serpentine. Classic serpentine. I'm sorry. Classic serpentine. Mm -hmm. Get your distance, get some lateral distance, and you can really cheat onto the next obstacle. So absolutely. You don't need to be close to any of the jumps. It's just that if you're going to do non-traditional serpentines, you want to be close to jump number two. Okay? So you can be as lateral as you want on jump number one. In fact, that's a brilliant way to do it. Let me give you a quick example. Let's say jump number one is over there. I'm headed at an angle. Hopefully I'm still in the camera shot here, okay? So instead of running it close, this is close, right? I'm running to the wing, close. I'm gonna be lateral as much as I can. Put my arm out, send the dog over the jump. And now turn the dog toward purple. And now I'm looking at the dog here, but by the time the dog takes off, look, I'm right here, right here by the wing. I'm close. So you can start far, just end up close, and now I can take the dog to the tunnel. And of course, if I'm doing the classic, I never get close, I just stay out here. So yes, distance on the first jump, totally okay. Um, send to the first jump, yes, that's fine. Liz wants to know, do you stare at the landing spot as you move ahead? Um, I personally do not, because in my opinion, once the dog, their front feet leave, there's nothing I can really do to alter their path. The best thing for me to do is get ahead, right? Now, I may look back over my shoulder to make sure the dog comes to the correct side, whether you're gonna blind or not, um, but I'm not really looking at the landing spot, per se, because they're gonna land. That, that decision was made by physics and the laws of gravity um, at the takeoff point, so I can't really affect it. So it doesn't help for me to look at the landing spot. That's my opinion. I know. I, I do know what you're talking about. So. Well, I guess before they've taken off, though, it's just it's a way to force yourself to turn in. Yes. Right? Oh, okay. So absolutely. Yes. I may have misunderstood your question. So if the dog is not yet taken off, and you're looking at the landing spot, um, looking at the landing spot and looking at the dog is a very small degree of difference. Either way, what it forces you to do is turn toward the dog, because it's impossible to run this way and look at the landing spot like this. So when the instructor says, "Look at your landing spot," you're naturally gonna do this, and guess what? Now you're turning toward the chest. So I'm telling you, point your chest and look at your dog. They're telling you, look at the landing spot. It's kind of the same thing. It's the same net effect. Even from far away, I'm telling you to look through. They're telling you, look at the landing spot, like this and this. Like, my head's perfectly still. Look, I'm looking at the jump. Now I'm looking at the landing spot. Now I'm looking at my dog. Now I'm looking at the landing spot. I'm looking at the tunnel. I'm looking at that old man over there on the sidewalk, right? 
my head, everything, the position is the same. The dog can't see where my eyes are looking exactly. Right? So it's all about the overall presentation. I use that trick a lot. You know, guys, do, we do that. We sit on a bench, we keep our heads perfectly still, a pretty girl walks by, and then we look at the, no? Okay. It's, it's basically like that. Okay, next question is, oh, that's all of them, right? Well, right you want to scroll down? About not, uh, other handling options for a serpent. Is okay. there a reason you are not including blinds in your discussion? No, you can go ahead and do blinds as well on your serpentine maneuvers. Um, there's just so much material here, including how to teach the serpentine, right? And a, a couple of other tricky spots that you might use it, that is a lot of information to put into one single thing. So right now, you've got a lot of people watching who aren't really sure what a serpentine is, right? Or weren't aware of which jumps could be a serpentine. Because once people get excited about serpentines, they're like, I want to do a serpentine here and there and everywhere. But you really need a good spot where a front cross on either side of a jump makes sense. I think the other thing that we're doing here is we pointed out at the very beginning that there is a difference between a serpentine setup and serpentine handling. And then we focused on that serpentine handling. So the blinds that you're talking about, that's a way to handle a serpentine, a serpentine configuration without necessarily using serpentine handling. And there's lots of other options like front crosses or rear crosses that you can use instead of that serpentine handling. But well, we were I, assume, focusing... I assume she meant like serpentine, uh, like a blind after the serpentine. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So if you're, so if you're asking like, um, well, okay. So Sarah, Sarah was kind of assuming like blinds replacing the fronts. Well, you can do that. You can also use rear crosses instead of the front crosses. So that's one answer. That's the answer Sarah's giving you. Uh, but then my answer for a, uh, like a serp blind. So you would serp, and then you can blind and pick your dog up over here and do that. So just know that you can do that, but it's just not. It's like an extra element that we didn't introduce today, although, of course, now we have. So very good question. Thank you for mentioning it. But you definitely can. So there are good spots to add blind crosses. For the most part, the handling is going to be the same there. <laughs> okay, Sarah Baker agrees. Save the thread alarm for threadles. Okay, this is why I always confuse this Sarah and that Sarah, and I send the wrong Sarah flowers on Mother's Day. Oh, I'm sure that's what happened. That's, I meant to say, I sent you flowers and they ended up in Washington. Uh -huh. And that's Sarah Baker. Sarah Baker, two-time national champ, agrees with this Sarah Fernandez Lopez. <laughs> so Sarah and Sarah agree. And once you throw in Brittany, that's three women. And that, that's already majority. It doesn't even matter. So they all like to use this arm here uh, and really preserve the opposite arm for their throttle handling. All right, so this is fucking it up. Okay, so Lauren wants to know, yeah. do you want to give them a bigger buffer? If they're a lot faster than you. If they are a lot faster than you. But not all of us, but we have speedy dogs. Can we do this at a distance? Yes, you can do it at a distance, but again, it depends what kind of distance, right? So as I mentioned earlier, you can do it from lateral distance, but you won't have the ability very well to do these non-traditional SERPs. Be very difficult for you to do it just based on body motion and position because your position is so bad, right? Your position really indicates the dog is doing something out here and not headed toward the tunnel, for example, okay? So in that sense, distance is bad. But for these traditional SERPs, yes, distance is very, very good. It's no problem at all. In fact, if you're starting on this side, you end up on this side, the more distance you have, the closer you'll be to the next part of the course distance is fine. So when you say distance, and we're talking about lateral distance, you're okay. Now, if you're talking about distance from behind, by definition, you're not doing serpentine handling anymore, right? You're doing, uh, you know, push, pull, out, verbal, other kinds of things. It's not serpentine handling if you are actually behind your dog. So you have to be ahead of your dog. So now if you've generated distance where you're ahead of your dog and the dog is behind you, then yes, you can be at the wing, you can be far away, Far away is okay for that. At the wing is better for that. But you need to be ahead of your dog. That's the only kind of acceptable distance in that sense. So as I mentioned, as we refined our serpentine handling, we actually use it a little bit less because we're not always sure we can get into ideal positions at big competitions. So at some point, serpentines become risky. Sometimes you'll see people, they put serps everywhere. Some of them are very good. Some of them are really bad, okay? Because they just can't get a tight line because of the off-course trap setups, but mostly because they can't get to the position that they need to. And what happens is they can't get that third jump. 
something goes wrong at that third jump. The judge does something unique, clever, or puts a fine discrimination there, and they go off course or take a wide turn, and then everything goes haywire. All right, we have last question. Okay, last question. Carol wants to know, how would you cue a run, a run by on the middle jump if the obstacle is between you and the dog? Just stay parallel and use motion without inviting them in at all. Yes. So there are many ways to teach serpentine handling. We kind of prefer to start it that way. A lot of people will just teach the dog to automatically run these lines in and out with you. I think that's okay. It's not a big deal. Eventually the dogs will pick up on other subtle body cues that you're giving. The problem with always saying, oh, if I run by a jump this way, I want my dog to automatically come in is, there are times you don't want that to happen at all. A judge is gonna force you to layer, and I'm just gonna bring in a jump here and show you. Uh, that's about five feet, okay? I, I was at a trial, yeah, I was at a trial where it was even closer than that. Um, so what might happen is you're coming in this direction at speed, right? And this is a trap both ways. For people who do SERPs and your dog doesn't turn very well, you're really driving them into that jump. And if you're late or you're racing them and you're just running by without turning toward them, you're going to push them over there. The flip side of that is if you want to do that jump, right, and you have to layer this, because this thing is in your way. Um, how would I make this in my way? I guess I could like do this. Something obnoxious, right? So now this jump is exactly where I want to run. And I can't jump through here, otherwise I would be eliminated. So that's what I want to do to get this jump. So how am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to have to layer it. So instead of running wing to wing, you're going to try and run on the outside of this wing. So it's going to be over, and then you're going to say over, and you're going to try and get around this wing. I think this is a little too tough of a challenge. Yeah, I, think about like the actual force layer that they do for Premier, where they have, it's, it's exactly like a surf, but tighter. Okay, that's a more realistic scenario. The, the one that I did for you is like painfully difficult. So you have three jumps. Very, very close. There's very little space in between here. And so here, if I turn toward them, we're going to serpentine the middle. And what Sarah's saying, if we're going to layer this, you don't want the dog to take this. So this is a good example by Sarah, because this is a scenario that is very common now. Every weekend, somewhere in America, somebody is doing this on a course. OK, now you can do this 180. So Sarah, you can come be my dog. Okay, so first, well here, you, you decide what handling I'm doing here, right? Okay, so that's the serpentine handling. And now I'm not going to turn toward the dog. So you can see how the two are related. That's why our key teaching point for the serpentine is to look toward the dog. If you don't look toward the dog, got an ambulance or something going by, if you don't look toward the dog, then you got to keep them on the outside. All right, so hopefully that answers that. All good with questions? All right, that's it. OK, so if you have any more questions, put them in the comment section. Definitely, uh, we will get to all of your questions. Thank you so much for joining us here at the New Time. Hope you guys enjoyed this. Happy training. We will see you guys next week.